Welcome to SRM Insider, the podcast from SRM, bringing you the latest news from the cybersecurity world uh, straight from our experts. Unfortunately, our experts are not available, so we are here today with Martijn Hoogsteeg. <laughs> uh, my name is Frank Kort, and we're going to talk about the show Hunted. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about incident response today. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and uh, what we do at SRM? After your introduction, I might not. <laughs> um, but sure, incident response. Um, I guess it's it's mostly in the name. We respond to incidents, cybersecurity incidents, to be more specific, um, which often means some form of hack or criminal that did something to an organization or a company. Um, we see ransomware in the news a lot. Um, a hacker comes in, um, gets access to a lot of data, encrypts it, takes the key, and well, asks for ransom, and you get the key back. Often they also steal some information, threaten to publicize it, um, um, and that's, that's one of the hacks that we often see, that we respond to as well, um, and will help a company investigate what happened and to bring them back online safely as quick as we can. Um, we also see a lot of different types of hacks, um, um, besides this ransomware, which has been in the news quite a lot, of course. Um, we do business email compromise quite a lot, um, which means an email account that was hacked and the criminal changing payment information or changing invoices or doing something else malicious with the access. Um, but we also um, respond to other types of investigative needs, for example, internal fraud, an employee that misuses his rights or access to do something he wasn't supposed to, uh, we'll investigate those as well, which is very different because then we're not working on bringing an organization back online. We're really only focused on the digital forensics work, proving what happened uh, on a specific device, on a specific machine, and drafting a good report that can also be used in a court case. Okay, and looking at the show hunted, uh, do you think it relates to instant response as we do it at SRM? Or what do you think about the overlap between those two? So I think there's a lot of overlap with the digital forensic side of it. Um, in our investigations, when we do instant response, we'll be investigating systems to figure out what happened on them. And on the show, uh, we'll go to fugitives' houses, we'll gather a lot of laptops, phones, other digital storage mediums and, and analyze them. Um, and we'll use the same techniques. Uh, analyzing a Windows machine that was hacked by a criminal is the same as analyzing a Windows machine that was used by its user previous to being a fugitive. Um, so on the show, we'll, we'll start figuring out what websites that they visit. Um, was, I think it was last season, I investigated one system and I saw that two days prior to this person going on the run, they looked at number plate recognition cameras in the Netherlands. So they knew exactly where these cameras were. That gives us a lot of information about how they go on the run because they're probably be avoiding those roads. Mm -hmm. um, so information like that gives us, gives us a lot of insight into how people go on the run. We also focus a lot on um, friends and family in their first circle, as we call it. Uh, because often they'll uh, reach out to them to assist in their um, in their flight. Um, and we get a lot of that information from laptops, from phones, um, who are their contacts, who did they, who did they send a lot of text messages to. Um, so that's very relevant and very similar to what we do uh, in our digital forensic investigation as mm -hmm. well. The goal is just quite different. Right, right, yeah. And uh, there's, uh, well, in our line of work, we do a lot of running around, and uh, there's also something like that going on in the show. So yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. So do you think that pressure is kind of comparable as well? Um, so yeah, there's there's the instant response side of things, which is not necessarily digital forensics. We are really working with organizations to bring them back online, which is not necessarily around what happened, but what do we need to do? How are you going to get back in operations? Are there maybe other ways. For example, we can try to recover your entire email system. It might take a week, but we can also just create a new email system right now. So you can at least start emailing and at some point we'll import these old emails. 
after a week, you probably realize you don't really need a lot of those organ meals. Um, and that's where the instant response side of things really focusing on how do I get an organization back online quickly? And there's a lot of pressure on that. Um, for an organization, every second that they're offline costs quite a lot of money. Um, but for some organizations, it's even more important if they're in pharmaceuticals, if they're maybe even in healthcare, if they're even a hospital, um, it's a lot more than money that's on the line. So every second counts. And I think that's very similar to Hunted as well. Every second that we have dangerous criminals running around in the Netherlands, because that's the scenario, counts. So the pressure is definitely on, and it's very similar. Yeah. Okay. And you've uh, in your show, uh, and you just mentioned that as well. You you deal a lot with uh, phones. Like you go to some somehow someone's house and you take that phone and you get some data out of that. So can you tell us a little bit about the process for that and what tools do you use to get that data? Yes, yeah, so this is also very similar to the to the normal um, forensics work that we do, dispute forensics, um, especially phones. We don't necessarily encounter criminals hacking them and, and them being part of bringing a company back online, but definitely on the digital forensic side of things, where we'll investigate potential fraud or any other type of, of uh, malicious things that an uh, employee might have done, then we always analyze the phone as well. So the process is very similar. We, we get this phone, might be off or on, um, and we create what we call an image from that phone. So this is a snapshot of all of the data that is on there. And we use special hardware for that. We have a, it's on the show as well. I, I bring it along. It's a special device that we can plug into the phone, creates this image. Uh, and then with special software, we'll analyze, okay, what apps were installed, what activity was on the phone, what websites were visited the last X days that might be relevant, um, which is which is very similar to the normal work that we would do with mm -hmm. mobile forensics. But if someone would show up to our office and say, look, I got this phone, it's from my neighbor or my, my friend, can you have a look at it? That would be illegal. Yeah. Um, but you you do do that in, in, in Hunted. So there's a difference between the reality and the show there, right? So. Um, yeah, there's, there's an entirely different legal perspective mm -hmm. because uh, on the show, we are um, uh, official police investigators um, with the permission, of course, of the contestants. In our normal line of work, we're just a private forensic company. So we need permission of the person we're doing investigations from. Um, privately at SRM, if we, um, we, we normally work for organizations or companies, and it's their devices that we're investigating because it's the work phones that they've uh, given to employees or work laptops, or it's their servers that people work on. Um, so that's why we're allowed to work on those. Um, and on the show, as we're uh, official investigators, we can um, cross that line of privacy, which is exactly what the show is about, to show what can police and intelligence services actually do, and what are they allowed to do. Um, and so we'll be able to go through someone's home, find devices, we'll uh, be allowed to analyze those devices. If there is some uh, um, account that we need to requisition information off of, we can do that as well. So uh, you'll see the requisition a lot of information from Google accounts, from Facebook, Instagram, etc. Um, and then if there's if there's like IP addresses involved, we can figure out okay, what service is that, what server is there. We want an image out of that. If they don't give us an image, we can go out and get it. Um, really all the techniques that police would normally use. Um, and yeah, we're not just allowed to do that as, as a private investigative company. No. So last season you were able to obtain a, a Tor server. Yeah, uh, or at least the servers offering uh, a, a, a dark web web page. Yeah. Uh, so uh, was this something that you were able to requisite because of the um, the law enforcement side of things, or how did that work? Yeah. So um, well, first we had to find the actual IP address of this server. So if you hide, if you have a service within Tor, it's called a hidden service. You can't actually find where it's hosted. Uh, so first we had to find that IP address, and then. When we had that IP address, we could requisition an image off of that server. It was hosted in Germany. Within the EU, there's a lot of um, legislative options to, to um, have another law enforcement, in this example, Germany, um, to gather such an image. Um, so we were able to do that. 
um, but finding that IP address is, was, was definitely very cool. Um, Marinas did this, what we actually did, and this will be a little bit technical, sorry for that. Um, a web page, if you visit it, it'll give some information, which we call the header. So it's, it's the first information a server gives back. It includes um, the first page, etc. Um, lots of information about the server. And what he did was he compared the header that the service was giving back on the darknet with um, information that is continuously being scanned on the normal internet. So you'll have services that go to each and every website that's online and he gathers this header information. So we compared that and we found the same header that we saw on the darknet with the header that we saw on the clear net, the normal internet. So we knew, okay, this is the IP address of that server. Uh, and that's why we were able to have requisition some of that information. So then we received the image, we do some analysis and, and we were able to gain some information about the, um, the eventual extraction point. Right. So that was a mistake from the, 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 the Tor server owner? Or... Right, yeah. You, if you're hosting something hidden in Tor, you're not supposed to have it on, online. Yeah. Uh, it was online very briefly, but enough time for that scanning service to come by yeah. and save that header yeah. information. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that was, that was a cool find. Yeah. Thank you, Martijn, for your expertise uh, on this uh, topic today. Uh, that was all we have time for today on the SRAM Insider podcast. Uh, we will have one more where we talk about advisory and how to protect against attacks and uh, what, what kind of work we do uh, and how that relates to uh, whatever is going on at Hunted at that time. So, yep. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast SRAM Insider. <laughs>